Welcome to the Total Connected Show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest, Brandon Quittum and Hess McCook. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming to my show. Late night, my time. How are you guys doing? Brandon, yeah, no, Hess. pretty good. L looks like we've covered uh, three very distinct time zones. So uh, <laughs> congratulations to all parties. Yeah, and actually, um, Ben Prentice excuses himself. He wanted to come on the show, definitely, but he, he's got promoted. Congratulations to him in his job. And I told him, you know, we can make this up maybe next time instead of you know, rescheduling again. So um, uh, he's really sorry he can't make it, but next time, hopefully. So, um, uh, Brenton, let me, let me start off with you. Um, I loved your article on mycelium. As I told you that, it's, it's really great um, inspiration and extrapolation, if I may call that, you know, when it comes to Bitcoin. Um, I want to ask you something straightforward um, for, for a very, you know, provocatively uh, deliberate question is that why not, uh, you know, pick, for example, also a culture of ants, you know, ants, the, the insects, what would be the difference between mycelium and ants and you know just break it down and i want to have has uh, take on that too yeah yeah good question and first of all thanks for having me on i'm, I'm super excited about the conversation so appreciate that i've listened to quite a few of your episodes so um yeah happy to be here so first off the easy question why mycelium and why not ants and it's it's kind of an interesting question right i think it was andreas who initially had the leaf cutter ants and the leaf cutter ants were sort of a representation of the Bitcoin network, right? We're each an ant and together all the ants form what looks to be like one organism. A single ant will sacrifice himself for the greater good and they sort of act um, automated in a way. Um, and how is that different from mycelium? So I guess why did I pick mycelium? Because I'm very interested in mycology. And so for me, that was just a natural thing. Like I was steeped in mycology. So that was sort of the easy pick. Um, but what are the differences? I'm not sure if I have like a good, hard, hard, fast rule here. But when I think about mycelium, it's actually one organism. And the ants have separate units that act as a whole, whereas mycelium has a bunch of separate parts, but it's really all one biological being. And you can see this play out with like the giant honey mushroom in Western United States. It's unsure exactly how old, but it's around 2000 years old. And it's the, the same DNA being reproduced. And so I think that's probably the main difference is it's a single unit, um, whereas ants, maybe individual units might have slightly different DNA, which would lead to um, evolution by natural selection. Whereas with mycelium, it actually upgrades itself over time. It absorbs genetic information and it learns from its interaction with its environment. So yeah, stressors force it to evolve. And you know, that's why it's able to stay so relevant and, and so competitive in its ecosystem for thousands of years. Great, great, great answer. I love that. So has uh, you've read um, uh, Brandon's articles on mycelium, yes. right? Yes, I have. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm three quarters uh, sold on, <laughs> uh, on his article. So I, uh, I definitely, uh, I definitely agree that, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, does reflect uh, mycelium. And I think uh, Brandon's uh, made a made a comment uh, on Twitter, he's put out a tweet in the past that uh, Bitcoin is is politics, and uh, and uh, and nature is 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 religion or something or something like that. Uh, That's so exactly for me, right. I, I wouldn't stop at Bitcoin being mycelium. Uh, my stopping point uh, is Bitcoin is literally nature itself. Uh, the you know uh, nature manifested in in money form or energy manifested in money form. And uh, and nature is as nature does, uh, and that's uh, and that's Bitcoin. But that's a very far out there, uh, broad generalization. I think the the closest down subset from that uh, would be uh, would be mycelium for sure. Mm -hmm. um, now, when it comes to because the thing is that the reason I ask about ants is that um, when it comes to um, incentive, incentivized behavior um, or 
let's say, you know, when, when there's a natural, you, you're talking about, you know, like natural, natural order, natural behavior, uh, everything that is natural is, is, is sort of imprinted uh, into your own, you know, uh, DNA, RNA, uh, you know, your mind, your consciousness. So is there, do you think you guys, you think there's a correlation between, um, you know, incentivized behavior, incentivized action, um, you know, until, for example, human beings start taking action because of a need, because of a, of a desire, um, and extrapolating that, you know, to mycelium or even ants, you know, is there, is there, is there like, is a desire imprinted already, or does it need to be uh, created, uh, the, the, you know, the environmental conditions, let's say? You know where I'm getting at? Like, uh, where, where can we find this this process until you know we as human beings as a, even you know let's say critical uh, 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 critical collective society uh, start like really uh, acting and 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 interacting decentralized uh, so the purpose so, is still sort of fulfilled you know so so for me uh, i i think the first instinct of life and nature itself, the first underlying core instinct uh, is to survive. Uh, and uh, second, and secondly, uh, ensure that your your genetics uh, survive. Uh, so, uh, so all beings will react in the context of nature, uh, uh, and you know they'll be incentivized by uh, by things uh, that ensure their survival. Uh, so, uh, so right now, uh, Bitcoin is all share and aligned uh, incentive, and a big aspect of that is uh, is our survival. And uh, this is why I say uh, stack sats uh, for salvation, uh, because just being involved uh, in in the ecosystem is uh, is, or for me at least, uh, satisfying my desire to survive. Uh, you know, when everything uh, inevitably hits the fan. I love that answer. And there's also a, a parallel here with the, the archetype that both Bitcoin, mycelium, the internet, um, dark energy, how our neurons are formed, this, this network archetype. It's, it's something we observe in nature at the very, very grand scale. So if you look at a map of the universe, you can see how uh, dark energy and, and matter interact and it forms this mycelial web, this uh, decentralized brain, essentially a network archetype. And you can zoom all the way into our neurons and it's the same archetype. And so what we're observing is that this pattern, it, it, it keeps popping up at different fractal layers and it persists for so long, for, for billions of years. Um, right now we've, we've uh, found mycelium on our planet, fossilized mycelium 1.3 billion years ago, which is now um, the oldest complex life on our planet. So if we extrapolate what that means, it means this network archetype might've been the archetype that fostered complex life, which led to all the different evolutionary paths that we have today. And so if this network archetype persists and it's that powerful, then what does that tell us about Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin and the internet are that same archetype. Um, humans create language. Humans, um, you know, you could look at a map of how we interact on the internet. It's the same process. And so when you look at it like that, uh, it's more like Bitcoin as a network money is not some crazy innovation that we just can't believe happened. Instead, this was a natural progression and humans just figured out how to optimize by looking at nature to create technology that mimics nature. So Bitcoin was inevitable. Do you think it's about a reversal of brainwashing, of indoctrination, because it's unprecedented. I mean, we've been, you know, I mean, come on, I mean, you know, we've been conditioned, conditioned for what? Uh, at least, you know, this monetary, uh, whatever, Keynesianism, central banking system in collusion with the governments, uh, it's it's what for 100 years but actually it's been ongoing the process has been ongoing for a long long you know it's been like almost you know over imprinted over our this natural order which is you know the natural imprint so do you think this is like a reconditioning to the natural process of how we think how we incentivize ourselves you know because this is what i'm saying people cannot even imagine what it could be like once bitcoin 
you know, is the monetary root layer, the root structure, the, the decentralized root structures that is unstoppable, uncontrollable, unconfiscatable, and unmani- unmanipulatable, if, if there's a word for that, right? So Definitely. I would say that it's um, if we're going to continue this network intelligence layer, I don't think uh, Keynesian economics or modern central banking are really um, the forces at play. I think we have to zoom way out. I think it's much bigger. It's really uh, a way to communicate how um, humans' needs are being met, like the purpose of money. It's a language that's uh, a common language that we all use to coordinate. And all it is, is we just have a more sophisticated language. And I am so confident in this type of sophisticated language we call Bitcoin or money because it mirrors a evolutionary robust strategy that persists through for so long. And so it really does feel like we finally um, came up with the right approach here. And just like how the internet or Twitter is like the, the global brain connecting us, this just removes friction and allows humans to coordinate on a much more sophisticated scale. And it sort of takes away our human weaknesses, right? It prevents us from dominating and from doing the things that we're programmed to do. It sort of tampers that and allows the wisdom of the crowd uh, to guard this money, right? Make it hard to change. And so, yeah, I'm not sure where Keynesian, Keynesian economics comes into this. Besides, that would be a perversion of what is, um, you could say, more natural. But I don't know if there really is natural money because it's constantly evolved over time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I feel like this is the, as good as we're going to get, at least um, as far as my life is concerned. Mm-hmm. No, I, I see, uh, as I, since I see Bitcoin as nature itself, uh, Bitcoin is finite. Uh, its uh, supply is finite, uh, but its time will be infinite. And uh, just like nature, it'll just change uh, to ensure its own survival or its inherent permanence uh, like nature. Now, with regards to Keynesianism, uh, you know, if you, if you build something, you know, unnatural on a natural surface, uh, nature is just going to lay waste to it anyway. So it's effectively Keynesianism is building a dam out of clay. Uh, one day this dam will go because it's just uh, not natural to try dam something up with clay. Yeah, it's a great analogy. It reminds me also like if we look at plastic, right? We're we're concerned about all the pollution that our species is creating, which we should be concerned about that. Mm-hmm. However, if you zoom out to a geological time scale, a planetary time scale, um, in our lifetime the plastic will be there. However, in the planet's life lifetime, let's say humans are wiped out today everything we've ever created will be completely gone in a blink of an eye based on our planet's capacity to recycle. And so I think it's kind of funny that Keynesianism could even be that plastic that we think in our human time scale lasts so long, but in our species and our planet, it's just a blink of an eye. George Carlin uh, once said that uh, the human's sole purpose uh, of living uh, was to provide the earth with plastic. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. And if you go back to mycelium with plastic, we're now finding that mycelium can break down plastic. It can break hydrocarbon bonds in oil. It can consume plastic. Right. Um, they're finding new species in uh, the Chernobyl area, mm-hmm. and it's consuming radioactive waste, breaking it down, and the, the, out, the byproduct is safe to consume. And so this mycelium, uh, like you said, with Bitcoin, it can teach itself, it can learn, it can adapt, and it can evolve. Mycelium is the same way. It says, holy shit, this radioactive waste, what a powerful food source. Let's send information back to the mushroom scientists. Let's figure out a way to eat this. And now it has incredible food source that nothing else around it can consume. So it carves up, continues to, to take up space. It's truly amazing. And you know what's so, ph- so phenomenal is the adaptation, what we all often forget, the adapt- adaptation of the human uh, being, of the human physicality, of the human DNA to new environmental conditions such as radioactivity. I mean, that's been proven in studies that it takes time, it takes years, maybe even 10, 20 years, but uh, especially, you know, children, they adapt to new environmental conditions. You know, whether that was, uh, I think there was a documentary on, uh, uh, gr- uh, you know, grandma in Chernobyl area, uh, you know, she was living 
pretty fine after that, you know. I mean, it's amazing. Or, or, you know, people in Fukushima, it's not, you know, I'm saying it should be uh, done on a systematic, <laughs> uh, you know, level, but, but, uh, but it's, I just think it's phenomenal how uh, human being, human structure, human, uh, uh, you know, DNA or, or information carrier can, can adapt to, the, to those new environmental conditions. So uh, going back to the mycelium, um, what I really found um, exciting, what you wrote is that this practical approach where you, let me show this, um, uh, which we just talked about offline previously, about this, uh, you said in this article, let's take a look at the Tokyo subway system to illustrate the power of decentralized networks. Can you go a little bit into detail about this experiment they did? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, this is a, a favorite on Twitter and also uh, for myself. So the slime mold is a organism um, that used to be considered a fungi and now scientists found out that it's not technically a fungi. So it, it left the fungi kingdom, but I, I hold it close and pretend it still is. Um, but what the, what the Japanese um, scientists did was they were trying to decide, are these organisms intelligent, right? Because they do demonstrate intelligence. And the way that they did that was created a map of the Tokyo uh, subway system. Each subway stop was a little bit of oat flake, which is the slime mold's favorite food. So it's essentially a maze and there's little rewards. And then they, they release the slime mold into the maze. And in about 24 hours, the first 12 hours, let's say, the slime mold extended its tentacles in all directions, growing extremely rapidly until it found all the food. And then the next 12 hours, it reorganized itself to create the most efficient network in order to eat this food and stay connected. And so then they're like, wow, let's look at the map. And to their surprise, they found out that the slime mold created a more efficient and more redundant, so a, a better subway system than the Japanese engineers could, could create on their own. And so what does this tell us? Um, number one, I'm not knocking the Japanese engineers. I'm sure that they were fantastic. However, there's something else here at play, and that is a decentralized intelligence network is a, is a better tool to solve certain problems. Like in this case, you're essentially solving the traveling salesman problem. So a very complex problem, and it would take a really big computer, a quantum computer to effectively solve it. But the slime mold simulates that because it's made up of all these individual parts where they communicate, they they talk to each other, but each individual part is making decisions that's best for itself in that moment. So it essentially pushes decision making to the edge, pushes complexity to the edge. And that's a pretty amazing thing. It also mirrors how we're looking at an information revolution where um, we used to have these hierarchical organizations where you essentially funnel information to the top and at the top of the organization, you theoretically have the best decision maker and all the workers are just gathering information so the king can make decisions. Where now we have the ability where information travels fast, facts are cheap, and more or less instant communication. So you don't need such a vertically integrated organization. In fact, it's more efficient to be more horizontal and let the people communicating with customers, for example, uh, make more decisions because they're the ones who actually have all the information. And so, yeah, all that's to say, um, Bitcoin also plays by the same rules where um, information and complexity decision-making is pushed away from the base layer, right? We want to maintain this, this heartbeat at the center of the network to be as, as simple, uh, stupid, if you will, as possible, reduce attack surface. And then we can push all the crazy stuff to the, to the second layers, the stuff that's not going to break consensus. And so, um, yeah, Satoshi, in my opinion, was a mycologist. I don't know how else he'd put all this stuff together. And if Satoshi was a mycologist, I'm sure he studied the slime molds and, and this type of network. Which, which again supports Haas' uh, statement previously that it's, it's a natural, what did you say? It's a natural thing, natural order, or it's nature? Manifestation, it's just a, the natural manifestation of money. So it's, a, it's, a, it's money in nature form. Mm -hmm. But it's also, uh, you know, energy and money form and energy is nature and, uh, you know, transitive property of algebra. Bitcoin is energy. Bitcoin is uh, nature. Bitcoin is life, uh, and uh, and all and all natural subsets of that. 
If you put that on a, on a time trajectory, where, where do you see this um, process, this evolution of, you know, because there's a vision, for, uh, right? Um, did you have a vision when, uh, Brandon, when you wrote this or when you wrote, uh, elaborated on research for that article? Did you have a vision how Bitcoin, you know, extrapolated or, you know, materialized sort of would, would look like, uh, uh, including on a time trajectory? I mean, is it like this or is it, you know? Ah, like, are you saying growth in terms of yeah. cap or uh -huh. how we want to measure it? Like, would it grow in the same way that like a biological simulation might grow or something mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't personally done much thinking on this. Um, however, I would assume that it follows the same exponential adoption curve that network technologies have where, you know, you, you build the base of people and, you know, you continually provide feedback to the product and it gets better and better. And then all of a sudden it, it goes vertical. And I would assume that Bitcoin follows the same principles. Um, it makes sense for there to be less or only one type of money, just remove friction. And so I think that's at play here. I think actually the hardest part about Bitcoin adoption is that we're all default Keynesians to, to take Brady from Citizen, Citizen Bitcoin's um, podcast's line there. And so we have this entrenched belief system and it's really hard to change culture as a species, right? Through our evolutionary biological history, we're, we're all conditioned, we're all programmed to not take too many risks. And so if we look at that programming, um, no one wants to be the first one to jump out and say, yeah, sure, I'll sell my government money and buy some crazy internet money. And so that middle part, that middle 70% of the population, um, they're gonna change really slow, right? Until you hit the quote tipping point. And I, I view the current Bitcoiners as like these, um, you know, you could say matrix from the Neo or these autodidacts, these polymaths, these seekers, these curious people, we all have a little rebel spirit in us, right? You can sort of archetype um, who these people are. We're comfortable going against the grain. We're comfortable at Thanksgiving tell our, telling our uncle he's an idiot. Um, you know, that's just like what what's being attracted into Bitcoin land right now. And getting out of that sort of ideologically motivated horde that we are now, um, I, I think it's slowly starting to happen, right? You see these little glimpses like U.S. senators saying there's Bitcoin and there's shitcoin. You can't subpoena Satoshi, right? Like, I can't believe this stuff is happening. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and you got Mike, uh, Michelle Pham and Russell Okung. We're starting to seep out into culture. And unfortunately, I don't know if the, the current Bitcoin horde is the right people to convince that middle 70. I think it might take this like um, slow drip down through culture where it needs to be more relatable, even if it's half true. Um, you know, having these cultural icons blab about Bitcoin might be what it takes because we come off as raving lunatics sometimes. And I, I, I don't know, like, should we be, you know, peddling the red pill on the corner or should we be building Zion's defense, which I just stole from a Tales from the Crypt podcast recently. That was fantastic. Um, blanking on the episode, but I think that's an interesting point. Like, should we be recruiting one by one, giving out red pills or should we be hardening the base and, you know, charging, going to mass, right? Like, singing the hymns uh yeah i know you're into that um or you know i'm not sure what, what that angle is but i just threw a lot out at the, at you guys <laughs> so uh so i uh, remember you talking about you know uh exponential s-curve technologies that we're that we're used to living with and seeing but uh do you know who invented the s-curve no uh nature no <laughs> so, uh, so all throughout the billions of years you have slow population growth, you know, and it's got extinction risk at all, at all periods of its growth. And then eventually it finds its niche, population explodes, and then the top flattens out. Now, once the tops flatten out, you either have sudden extinction, uh, it happens numerous cases over the yep. past 3 billion years, or you get a little burst of improvement that takes you up to the next level of the S and so on and so forth. And, uh, and that's what's gonna happen with Bitcoin. We've seen that happen, S curve go and keep going. And uh, I think we're at the very, very bottom of the flat Bitcoin S curve. 
uh, once people figure out uh, that they do need to shift to our S-curve or risk extinction, uh, people will shift over and uh, we'll be ready for them with good plug and play solutions, uh, more innovation on the base layer, more innovation on the second and third and fourth layers. Uh, so I think, uh, again, it's self-interest and survival instinct in all of these. When, when people see it uh, and you know see that you know maybe they should be happier with a job than with savings. Okay, I was uh, just going to mention that but okay, <laughs> when you talk about like survival and like if people don't get it right now in these crazy times, I don't know when. But you right, know, but when you hear well, shit like that, maybe yeah. you have to start thinking about your survival, don't you? Yeah. Also, I think you should just be thankful that you have some employment. You're stepping yeah. out of line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Be happy. You know, I mean, you're a slave. You're, you know, you 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 pay taxes. Be happy. You know that you are serving. Uh, yeah. You know, the very few at the, I don't know, tip of the pyramid. So you don't need a savings account, Haas. Definitely no, not. No, as no, long no. as you work eight hours a day for the rest of your life, you're you're fine. You'll be able to eat. It might be insects that you're eating, but you'll be fine. You should be grateful. Will be, will be difficult to find a job that's only eight hours a day. <laughs> Harvesting insects. Yeah. <laughs> but it really takes a sociopathic arrogance, a degree of arrogance, um, or I don't know, the assumption from Lagarde. Uh, is she already officially now the ECB president of the European uh, Central I Bank? Think, I think there's like still more like two or three more weeks of overlap between her and Draghi before she officially takes the reins. But she's effectively, you know, active, uh, uh, you know, active head. Uh, oh, okay, okay. It's says incoming. incoming. In TV yeah, so she's calls. still got a few more weeks of, of overlap with, with her and Draghi, but you know, effectively you can you can take this statement as coming from the head of the ECB. Okay. Be happy with a job, slave. Uh, leave yeah. the savings to us. Yeah, I mean the funny thing is she is herself. A, let me just say a puppet. I mean she uh, she was chosen deliberately for this position because she does exactly uh, what she is. You know commanded to what do you call it like asked to do and otherwise she wouldn't be in that position um but having the the arrogance and the what do you what do you call it chutzpah <laughs> to to say something like that uh, i mean it should be, i don't know why 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 doesn't why does this, this statement make people think uh, or you know start <laughs> thinking much shit about lagarde and they cut him off <laughs> oh no here we are we got him back <laughs> It's instable. It says it's not stable. My internet connection. So okay. Uh, did, did you did you get a chance to hear what I just said? No, please. Can you repeat that? I said uh, you were talking too much shit about the ECB, <laughs> so they cut your connection. It's no coincidence. Doesn't it's not the first time, you know. But you know, I can't. I can't help. Synchronicity, it. as uh, yeah. Gigi would say. Yeah, Don't... you better put your VPN back on. Yeah, no, no, no. I can slow down even much more my, my bandwidth. So uh, if we want to try to uh, tie it a little bit together, um, um, the, the, all these you know, external events, the, the, the pressure, the, all these you know, geopolitical, macroeconomical, uh, and then maybe come back maybe to the mycelium, to the essence of mycelium, is that when things happen, when, when conditions are created, that put pressure on the collective uh, of this decentralized network. Do we, this is what I'm asking. I know I'm repeating sometimes myself, but do you think this would accelerate the, uh, going forwards to that tipping point, Brandon? I mean, in, in you know, especially in the case of you know extrapolating the mycelium philosophy on Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good, good question. Um, we are definitely in a strange time and, and, and sort of the macro conditions. I, I feel like every time I open up a browser on Twitter, there's another country rioting. And it's cool to watch them sharing tips. Like I saw one today, I think it was in Chile. Um, they were jumping on top of the armored sort of like tanks that shoot water guns. And some guy was deadlifting the water gun right off the top of the car and then jumping off. And apparently they're, they're learning. So um, anyways, that's what I was doing earlier today. Uh, the question is the macro conditions. They're getting strange. And how does Bitcoin plan? And I would say that Bitcoin uh, 
you know, from straight from the seam to lab, it is anti-fragile. So it does gain from the chaos. It's built for that. Um, whereas centrally planned systems by design, they cannot prepare for the, the, the chaos, right? It's, it's impossible to plan for. And so when you look in that condition, I would say Bitcoin is suited really well. Um, and if we want to look at how mycelium uh, handles complexity or, or handles chaos, I think that's a pretty useful analogy. And so if you think about a, an, in a forest floor, um, just beneath the forest floor, there is a incredible battle going on 24 seven microbiology fighting microbiology, whether it's fungi, bacteria, insects, all this stuff is competing for a finite number of resources. And how is it that a one cell walled root structure which we call mycelium how does it survive in such hostile conditions and the answer is because it can evolve and it creates custom enzymes to defend itself so it's constantly spreading its tentacles um, sensing its environment sharing information bi-directionally sharing resources and if a if a uh, threat comes up information sent back throughout the organism it creates a new custom enzyme lock and key to uh, handle that threat and in the process okay it handles that threat but it also learns something it keeps that new enzyme in its chemical library for future predators and over time this this effect compounds and so with an organism like that it's constantly learning adapting gaining new tools um, chaos is no problem right in that environment mycelium will outcompete chaos all day long and so sort of gets hardened from that complexity. And I think Bitcoin was designed the same way. Um, over the long enough term, I'm you know nearly 100% confident in Bitcoin's um, success. However, in, in let's say there was a, some sort of financial crisis globally now, today, how would Bitcoin perform? I'm less confident on that. I would say it's on, I think the longer we delay this financial crisis, the better for Bitcoin. Um, if, if we had a 2008 type situation today, I think Bitcoin would go down with the ship. Um, but I think it would slowly rebuild and come out stronger and eventually um, take market share from the global finance uh, market. However, yeah, I, I would like to see a little more QE, give Bitcoin a little more time and, you know, let these tentacles get a little bit stronger and, you know, a few more politicians speaking out, a few more celebrities speaking out. And because we really, really, really do want rich, powerful people to buy Bitcoin today because they're the people who will push back against the government when the government says, hey, give up all your Bitcoin or it's illegal. Right. And so the longer we're under the radar, the longer we're um, sort of underappreciated the better, right? So mm -hmm. government hubris is our friend. Totally agree. It's uh, necessary for the soft landing. I think uh, if institutions and all of those guys, uh, you know, roll up now and, and make the price moon, uh, you know, old hodlers, you know, would be happy. Uh, but, you know, then the, the power is back with the bastards. Uh, so hopefully price can stay low for a while and let the little guy uh, stack, as, stack as much as possible. And uh, what did you mean by go down with the ship precisely? As in like, see the price plummet to zero? Oh, no, 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 temporarily go down. Like we just have like another what? prolonged bear thousand dollars? I have no idea on the price. <laughs> cause I'm I just telling think, you, there's enough he's holders just, he's just of waiting last stack resort. <laughs> no, no, cause there's enough holders of last resort that like there is a floor, like a floor price for Bitcoin. If the simp if the system is functioning and Bitcoin is working, there's always people with cash. Always. Yeah, uh, I, I wholeheartedly yeah. agree with that. It, it so would be it, more it's like so small now and requires so little money to like maintain its floor price that like I seriously don't think like if the if the stock market were to drop thirty percent, uh, I wouldn't. Like even if Bitcoin drops sixty percent, like that's not a drop for Bitcoin. We eat sixty percent for breakfast. Uh, but a thirty percent drop in the stock market will ruin the world. Well, no, you're you're absolutely right. Won't Bitcoin ruin Bitcoin. Market. No, no, you're right. Bitcoin's tiny. I guess I made that comment because there's a narrative that that Bitcoin is going to be counter cyclical to the markets or uh, negatively correlated to mainstream finance. 
and I just don't know. I don't know how true that is. Um, Bitcoin's fine. Just it's not going to gain. It's not going to. The stock market's not going to go down, and Bitcoin's going to go up in lockstep. I just don't see that happening. Yeah, just as Colin would say, uh, the the planet is fine. It's the people that are fucked. Uh, same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is fine. It's uh, it's fiat that is uh, fucked. Uh, so uh, yeah, Bitcoin's always going to be here, whether fiat collapses or not. Uh, that's it. It's digital nature. Unless yeah. you turn off the digital world, uh, you know, which you can't now, uh, because like uh, mycelium, there's uh, you know too many things depending on it for its own survival to let it to let it die. So, uh, so I think uh, just the mycelium nature of, of Bitcoin uh, brings inherent defense to Zion. And you know, after so nearly social defense, social defense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after nearly 11 years, it's just, you know, the cat is out of the bag, as I always say, or the genie's out of the bottle, whatever you want to expression <laughs> you want to use. It's just too many, too many of us uh, that have convictions, really strong convictions and trust. I mean, uh, maybe we can talk about, you know, this, have you, uh, if I may mention that, have you, uh, you haven't, um, when are you planning to uh, publish your article, which I had the honor to, you know, read the draft uh, has? Uh, that's uh, that's now pending uh, uh, release in the Bitcoin time. So I think we're all waiting on Dan Held to oh. write his piece. Shout out to Dan. Shout out to uh, Dan Held. That, that should be coming out in the, hopefully in the next week or so. Yeah, it's a great masterpiece. So, uh, target yeah. target release was uh, was late October, uh, early November. So uh, maybe I'll have to come back uh, a few months after that one goes out, and we'll have another chat. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So what I was gonna say is, you know, it's already too many of us who have really strong convictions, knowledge, comprehension, and I always say trust because trust is knowing, like in the being. And uh, I think we're still in this phase of you know, hoping, wishing, <laughs> I don't know, it, 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 it feels like it, you know, that there's more and more momentum building up for other people that are coming, you know, into this Noah's boat, <laughs> whatever you call it. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, we shouldn't take it for granted. I think it was a process and experience of a lot of people that have been going, you know, going in into from different angles or different rabbit holes. You know, each of us has like a different path of finding oneself, like making it click, like the aha moment, you know. Oh, absolutely. Me, G Gigi right? wrote a fantastic yeah, shout uh, out to him. on yeah. that uh, a couple of days ago. So, uh, no, I was very glad uh, to be in Riga around the time Gigi had his uh, religious breakthrough. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. The, the rabbit hole... Uh, isn't really a hole. It's more like a canyon. <laughs> so there's there's several ways to jump into the canyon. Uh, like you're not restricted through that small little hole that you have to burrow in. It's just, it's there, the rabbit canyon. Uh, find it anywhere you like. Is there anything, I think it's... sorry, uh, is there anything you guys that, um, that has changed for you from your perspective, from your comprehension level? Like, like you're saying, you know, you would say to yourself, oh, you know, this is like totally changed. Uh, I mean, from your pers perspective, from your understanding uh, in the last few years, like right to the essence of Bitcoin, like where we would say, oh, why didn't I get that? Like, you know, a few months or a few years ago. Hmm. Yeah, for me it was the for me it was the spiritual stuff, uh -huh. uh, putting it putting it all together in the in you know how there's that p equal n p problem or whatever the hell the the tech guys talk about. Uh, for me, it was the 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 linking uh, of uh, Bitcoin is e so capital B Bitcoin is equal to capital E energy, and lowercase b Bitcoin is equal to lowercase e energy. Uh, when I was able to connect those two and have like my spiritual revelation based on those facts, uh, I went from there because capital E energy is effectively uh, synonymous with the universe. Uh, it is uh, all mass 
uh, that's uh, it's all you know mass and energy that's that's ever existed finite infinitely divisible bitcoin capital b finite lowercase b infinitely divisible and uh, since everything is nature and bitcoin is energy bitcoin is everything uh, so when i was able to link that in my you know religious uh, uh, enlightenment uh, uh, rabbit hole experience uh, that's probably when my life changed so it's been uh, been just over three years uh, since that trip down the rabbit hole literally in the rabbit hole so i was lucky enough to be sitting in the in the master's garden at christ church in oxford and uh, yeah that's where alice in wonderland was written so uh so i was very very uh, very lucky uh, to have had my uh, revelation there awesome lightning brand you were just gonna you were gonna say something yeah, I forgot what I was actually going to say a moment ago, but it's really hard for me. Th this question gets asked a lot on podcasts, like what's a recent revelation or what really clicked for you? And I can't really pick one besides it, it mirrors nature, right? That was obviously the big one for me. We've already talked about it. However, there's so many, it, it's like a constantly my mind is blown with Bitcoin and seeing how different people approach this same question or what is Bitcoin from their own lens, right? We all have our own some total of experiences that make up our perspective and to the banker it's uh finance rails to the mycologist it's holy shit it's a mushroom you know right from all these different angles it's different things and so one recent one that actually two two comments come to mind one is uh the article bitcoin is a decentralized clock i'm sure you guys have read this one i thought it was oh, one I, of the I most i haven't actually which one oh man you're gonna like this one um, I think it's called Bitcoin is a decentralized clock. Who's the author? Um, uh, do you know the author? Um, Gorm, maybe. If you Google that, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. But okay. um, it, it's essentially looking at the history of time. And this guy, I forgot who it was, he essentially figured out like the essence of Bitcoin is not just money or it's not just a messaging system or whatever. It's actually a clock. And so the hard the hard problem measuring time is that we don't actually measure objective time right so if you think about the history of of time and clocks we would use the sun or the moon or the planets and that's how we would measure time and then we created mechanical clocks and we'd have wristwatches and there'd be one main clock in london london standard time so all the people would come to the city they'd see the one clock that everyone coordinates off they'd set their wristwatch to the london time and then they'd leave and they'd come back a week later and their clock was all messed up because we're using mechanics to try and measure time right so it's not perfect and then we created uh, atomic clocks which is the decay of atoms which we follow relatively uh, consistently it's much better than um, mechanical time and he essentially takes this article into, okay, Bitcoin is a, a way to tell time. You tell time in blocks. And so it's not necessarily a individual unit that's consistent, but you have this relative time and this relative time on our planet coordinates and we all sync up on this one time. And so that's sort of a, a really, really gross explanation of this guy's article, but um, very mind blowing. And it's cool to look at Bitcoin, not as money. Right. And, it could be so much more. Like, I think this thing, I think we're just monkeys poking it with a stick at this point, to be completely honest. Like, yes, it's money. And the fact that it's money will uh, incentivize people to explore it more and to bolt things on and see how we can leverage it more. But I think, I think it is, I think it's much more than that. The you absolute scarcity, uh, can we talk about it because you've mentioned it again, the finite supply. Uh, would you say that this is something so unprecedented, unprecedented in human history that it ch would change a lot of things, a lot of other things, the, this, this absolute scarcity of Bitcoin with 21 million in connection with time? Is that something that will, like... I don't know, create totally new structures? I think it's a fundamentally useful tool to have the ability to um, use a scarce asset, right? We don't, we don't have any way to do that. Gold's pretty scarce. Um, and a lot of people talk about uh, Monsieur, Robert Breedlove, et cetera, how Bitcoin and time are the only scarce things on our planet. And from that perspective, 
Um, why would you want to work for something that's not scarce, right? You spend scarce resources, which is time, and you earn a non-scarce resource. And we're supposed to be thankful for that. And I think that's just madness, right? And it's not just like, hey, I want my work to be meaningful and I want to have more money or something. It's more like on a population scale, on a whole human scale, it's really inefficient if we work and we don't uh, retain the capital, right? We want the people who create value to retain capital and then allocate that capital. That's better for everyone. And so having this fundamentally scarce resource, it, it just signals, uh, it's just a tool to signal what to create and the right people to create it. And that is going to make humanity better. And that's fantastic. And it's a totally deflationary money, right, Hess? I mean, so, uh, you, you mentioned something about, uh, you know, the, the, the scarcity uh, uh, giving us the option to build new structures. I think uh, the, the scarcity aspect is the first time uh, that we're now allowed to set clear boundaries. Uh, and by boundaries, you can also call it lines in the sand. So economic fair play boundaries. Uh, and then the, the structures will be built within those boundaries. Uh, so you've got, you know, a boundary of, you know, this is, this is your finite uh, resource set, uh, build your structures accordingly. Uh, so for example, the, the world fiat and banking structure uh, is boundless. There are no boundaries uh, you know, or, or controls uh, on it, whereas Bitcoin provides the ultimate boundary, uh, 21 million coins, uh, build, your, build your structures uh, with that in mind. I like that. It's also a interesting way to say um, there's a game we all play, right? The game is to increase our personal standing in the world, let's say. And in order to play the game effectively, you want to know the rules. And once everybody knows the rules, we all play the game and the best player win, right? But what happens when the rules change all the time? And, you know, you segment certain people with separate rules and you leave and there's new rules and they change all the rules again. Every generation, there's new rules. Um, that's very, very disruptive. And it causes not only personal and like, you know, our, in our small human units that causes tremendous damage, but also causes damage on our species. Like we need to have one set of rules, which is Bitcoin. This is the game. We're trying to get as many of these fucking Satoshis as we can. And if everybody knows the game, we'll play the game and, and okay, let's, let's extrapolate this. Now that we have a fair game, um, it's going to channel the energy, channel the action, the intentions of humans uh, to do what we're best at to build things, make tools, make your life better, et cetera. And channeling that like a laser is gonna increase productivity on our planet tremendously. Think about all the people that are not part of the financial system or their money is inflated away so they can't really contribute. That's, that's causing harm to everyone. Um, I forgot who said the quote, but it's, we were promised flying cars and all we got was 280 characters. I think that's just a fantastic line because once we, we've created this culture of dopamine, essentially we're all addicted to dopamine and that distracts us from long-term planning, long-term goals or money's uh, in the same category there. What if we removed all that? What if we did focus long-term? Would we be in space? Would we have um, far better structures on, on our planet here? Like, we should be in the outer outer reaches of our own solar system by now. Instead, we're we're nowhere. We're we're watching Netflix and living for the moment. And we should be grateful to eat bugs and work our whole life. Like these things are insane. Bitcoiners realize this. We also sound insane trying to explain this to someone who's yeah. like, "No, everything's cool. What are you talking about?" And psychologically, emotionally, socially. Um, it takes away the fear of people finally, because when you have a value, when you have a money that is disinflationary, that actually grows in value, you know, I, I just tweeted recently, like imagine a child or a kid, you know, going into a toy store and buying, you know, a toy and then, you know, maybe a year later, you know, you can buy with that same one Satoshi, with that one single Satoshi. <laughs> let's say, I don't know, 10 times more toys or, or products. 
I mean, this is unprecedented. You don't, you know, people then, once they don't have the fear of losing value, of losing wealth, of losing their existential, you know, freedom, um, I think that does something to humanity, to society in, in at large. What do you think, Has? Yeah. Uh, you know, as long as people are, are, are grateful for their jobs, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I see uh, that all that that's all part of uh, that's all part of the the natural S curve, right? And people will, will choose to to join the S curve uh, where they like, but but uh, the people who don't uh, join it are headed for sure extinction. Uh, so. Uh, you know, more and more people, you know, will will tack onto it. As more people tack onto it, it'll become uh, more disinflationary, yet more stable. And it's just the the self self uh, fulfilling uh, property, uh, just like the mycelia at Chernobyl. Right? No one else. There's no one else in the market. And the way this thing operates is just it swallows up the market. Uh, and that's and I think uh, Bitcoin will will uh, will mirror that indeed yeah self-fulfilling prophecy <laughs> what a great thing um so yeah so um yeah let me let me wrap this up uh, maybe because uh, what, what what is it what is it is there something that right now at this at this juncture people do you, do you feel do you have a feeling you people are understanding more like i think they will soon I think uh, memes are very powerful things. I love memes. I've loved and wasted countless, maybe thousands of hours looking at memes over the better part of a, a decade and a half. And uh, Bitcoin is a, is a solid meme. Uh, religion is also probably a very, very solid meme. So combine those two memes together and it's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very strong. But on the other side, memes like the guard uh i imagine things like these will catch on more and more and more uh, over the next years and these memes are, are just as uh, beneficial uh, to, to bitcoin as our you know bitcoin shit posting uh, means and i think as more people tack on to like the deep-seated like uh, uh corruption at bank so you can be at home like you've come home from a hard day's work you've been on the tools for 12 hours you know, you've got bills to worry about and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, you know what, that's just the, the way of the world. That's, you know, how we're all living. And then you turn the TV on and you, you see this lady speaking from an ivory, from a tower so ivory that it's, it's blinding in direct sunlight, yeah. saying you should be thankful for your job <laughs> and don't worry. And, you know, we save your money so you don't have to. <laughs> Uh, oh, so yeah, I think memes cool. like this, and 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 they will become uh, like I imagine, like uh, memes like this will be more and more frequently occurring as the QE taps uh, keep going, and the arguments, you know, people just putting their hand up and saying, "Where the hell is all my money going?" Like you know, I used to be able to buy a kilo of meat for seven bucks a few years ago. Now I'm paying twenty bucks a kilo. Like uh, you know, my wage hasn't gone up. 70% and now you know I'm, I'm supposed to be happy that I even got a job uh, like that's enough for me to want to go start a revolution uh, but I, I already joined the revolution about six years ago so I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm set for my uh, revolutionary roadmap the opt-out the opt-out revolution <laughs> I love that I think you touched on a couple of things that I was going to mention as well one is the um, it's really easy to be pessimistic if you look at um, just general markers geopolitically around the world. And now we have the ability to spy on anyone's backyard. And so we can actually, it, it's really hard for humans to grapple with all the shit that's going on around the planet. And it, it, there's a general sense that it's getting worse. And that's probably stemming from inequalities that most average people feel. And so when I think about Bitcoin, you mentioned the word the revolution, and I, and I think that it absolutely is. Um, I think Bitcoin is sort of like the rallying cry for the revolutionaries. It's the flag in the sand. It, it's where it's the nucleus that draws people in. And I think it's going to be more than Bitcoin. I think it's going to be privacy, taking our data back, 
um, you know, not eating bugs, eating real food, all these things kind of come together. It's just sort of the, the counter force um, to what's sort of manifested in our, in our culture today. And for me personally, I, you know, I used to be much more politically motivated, try to change the system, you know, get the right, if we, as long, if only we elect the right guy in the office, mm -hmm. everything will be good. <laughs> and that is the biggest lie imaginable. And I think once I realized that that's not the game, right? We're not changing this game from the inside. It, it's derelict. It, it's past. Um, instead, let's build our own system, right? Very cyberpunk ethos, which I didn't know at the time. But Bitcoin's given me tremendous optimism. It, it's where all the political energy goes now. Um, I don't give a shit when the when the politicians say crazy things or they do this or do that. Um, you know, whatever the system's going to break, and hopefully we build something better to replace it in as short of time as possible, and hopefully it doesn't harm as many people um, as it could without Bitcoin. And so, for me, it's very optimistic. Um, that's sort of the political side. Let's put that aside for a second. Um, the other thing, talking about um, look, I guess, kind of looking at the future and adoption and memes and what is this thing? Where are we? I think a really, really important one that's not really talked about a lot um, is how millennials, they, they don't want to save, right? There's, there's no reason to save. And we could look at this as a cultural thing. It could be related to money slipping out between their hands. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it is. However, I think Bitcoin does make saving sexy, right? You, you made that comment about the little kid. If you teach a kid, you get one toy today or two toys tomorrow. Uh, most kids are still going to take one toy, but I think that that lesson itself is powerful enough where young people, um, the millennial generation, which are stepping into power in the United States, um, generally young people are on the rise. And if they have this opportunity where the stock market's out of reach, there's no point to buy that. They can't afford a house. Um, the jobs really aren't there. We're drowning in student debt, all these things. Bitcoin's really, really, really the only way out for, for the, the average young person. And so I think the meme of making saving sexy or stacking sats is sexy, whatever. If we can sort of shift that narrative from live for today and, and instead, um, I mean, just look at the chart. If you show the chart to a kid, like we understand greed. Humans fundamentally understand saving for tomorrow. It's built into us, right? If you kill the antelope, and you don't eat it all, you need to preserve it, smoke it or ferment it or do something. Like humans have been doing this forever. And it just sort of feels now that there's this general air of hopelessness for young people. And make saving sexy and rally around Bitcoin. I think those are, are truly powerful forces that I'm not sure where this is going to go. And, and Gigi says we're already there. Some people say we're already on the way up, all these things. I don't know. Um, but I think those two forces are powerful enough to take this thing, um, you know, an order of magnitude higher without too much trouble. And, the thing is, uh, even if it goes up an order of magnitude, so, mm -hmm. so this is how I think about it. I think there's probably only maybe a hundred thousand max holders of last resort. Max. So, uh, max. So uh, at, at this price point, uh, to keep the, the price stable, it's only, it's only $16 million a day. So if there was actually a million holders of last resort, do you think they couldn't cough up 16 bucks a day? Right, Easy. so there's not that many holders of last resort. So it's got space to go up another five orders of magnitude from 100,000 to a million to 10 million, 100 million, billion. Like there's a lot of room, so so we're not talking order of magnitude. Like we're talking several orders. So, like uh, Bitcoin Twitter's a bubble. There are no daily stat, stat stackers. Uh, if there was a decent amount, if there was a million, five million, ten million people putting in, you know, ten bucks a day, if there was ten million putting in ten bucks a day. Uh, uh, the price of a Bitcoin would be ninety thousand dollars. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I like that well, model. I also like that many the... people and it's not even that many people, 10 bucks a day for 10 million people. Isn't even that many people. Uh, so that's why like, uh, don't even worry about order of magnitude, uh, worry about four or five. Yeah. I really like the tithing Bitcoin 
that you came up with Haas. I think that's a perfect way to look at it. Just set it with a little bit here, a little bit there, just pay your dues. I think that's a fantastic way to look at it. Um, I also, the, I'm, oh, go ahead. Cause the, cause the, the stability. So like, like you'll talk to, to any charity, they'll say, look, we'd rather you commit 20 bucks a month than give us 500 bucks cash right now. Cause we can rely on that cash flow. Uh, for the unbanked to be able to rely on Bitcoin, they need to rely on, you know, the selfless tithers that are happy to absorb the market and hold the market. Uh, and like I'm telling you, there's probably max 100,000 of those people right now. Crazy. Yeah, that solves a lot of Bitcoin's problems too. Smoothing out the volatility. Um, you know, you yeah, also... I said, it, I, I, I said it on rapid fire. If you want the price to be stable, you got to put your nuts on the table. Yeah, nuts on the table. Uh, so exactly. you got to be you got to be willing you got to be willing to, to to risk things. Like if if we're serious about a revolution, people have to to take revolutionary steps. Yeah. Yeah, it goes back to that you know trust and conviction and uh, real knowing that this is this is happening and it's just. It's by order of magnitude with you know, the, the, the power of, of the believers stems yeah. from their faith in each other. Yeah. Uh, and currently I've got faith that about, uh, uh, 40 million, 20 to 50 million people share my faith. They don't share my, my huddle and the daily stacking, but at least they, they share the faith, uh, uh, you know, and, and effectively is faith. Like I need to have faith that you're going to take my Bitcoin. Uh, and you need to have faith that I'm going to, I'm going to take yours or well, not, you know, confiscate, like accept, uh, when, when you pay me and, uh, uh, you know, the, the strength of Bitcoin will, will come from, uh, the faith that the believers have in each other. Right. So Bitcoin is a yeah. faithless system. You don't need to have faith in Bitcoin. Bitcoin works. Bitcoin is Bitcoin is energy, nature, and life. Uh, but we need to have faith in each other if we're gonna if uh, we're gonna make it as a as a as a species in a in a survival respect. Don't worry about Bitcoin. Bitcoin will survive. Now, Brandon, uh, you said something previously. You know, like because I, I'm you know I'm not the only one. There's so many people, even I think Safid and Amus talked about this. Like you know, going to the uh, voting booths. You know, when it's when it's election day. People, I mean, there's more and more people, I think, uh, like me, you know, totally not going to, you know, not going to vote anymore. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, I'm not nurturing the system anymore. It's, 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 it's illogical. It's, uh, you're supporting the system. It doesn't matter whatever color, party, whatever it is. So I wish that would happen in synchronicity uh, with, with the ever growing number of hodlers of last resort, you know, not going to the a voting uh, what, do you, what do you call it voting booths or something like that so because it, it doesn't change anything this is this is the problem people don't understand they they think whatever every four years or whatever time frame in intervals people are going into the you know you know this and that party or always the same party it doesn't matter it doesn't change any anything in in within the system so we got to opt opt out of it and if 30 40 50 percent of the population wouldn't go voting anymore then i think that would really uh w you know a shock wave would go through the system and then eventually that would breed a new you know mycelium <laughs> root structure the, you know? the, the shock wave will come if those 30 million people instead of rocking up to the voting booth that day still leave still leave the house still go on a trip but go down to the to the bitcoin atm booth uh, if you can get 30 million people down there yeah. that'll be a that'll be a shockwave uh but in australia we've got mandatory voting actually so uh really we don't actually have to we don't actually have to vote we just got to go down and cross our names off the list wow i didn't know that so we That's go down cross our names off the list uh, if we don't cross our name off the list, it's like a $90 fine. Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, but it's not illegal to put in an empty ballot. It's not illegal to, you know, write, write in. Yeah. It can not illegal to, you know, write whatever you want on the, you know, on the vote and put it in. Obviously, it's a, 
it won't count for anything. Uh, but yeah, unless you go down to vote, you get fined in Australia. This is wow! Well, that's something I never state yeah, and federal never, elections. Amazing! That's amazing. crazy. Yeah. So I've got an idea that just came to me during this conversation. Yes. Uh, what? Well, before I get to that, one. It's funny, Australia is mandatory voting. In the U.S., people are trying to prevent the opposing uh, base for voting. <laughs> oh, it, uh -huh. um, that's funny. But the, the new campaign I just came up with, let's see if this thing sticks, is you know how there's a meme where it's like vote with your dollar, right? It's the, sort of the same thing we're talking about. You can't change politician. Uh, don't regulate Walmart. Just shop somewhere else, right? Everyone knows this. What if on election day in the U.S., which I think will be a very turbulent time, roughly one year from today, a little more than that, um, what if instead of saying the I voted sticker, we have a campaign where it's like I stacked and everyone votes, <laughs> but you vote with your dollar, you vote with your Bitcoin. So let's create stickers that say I stacked or I voted for whatever we want to call it. I think I stacked is probably the move, but. Okay, let's yeah, try I, to do uh, it. I totally agree. And, uh, uh -huh. and you know, like uh, putting your nuts on the table is just <laughs> another way of saying putting your money where your mouth is. And, uh, you know, if you're actually with it and you're a revolution, I'm not telling you to, you know, to abandon the fiat system altogether. Although I do re greatly respect people that make that move, like uh, Max Hillebrand made that move uh, very, very recently that he's no longer going to participate in the fiat system. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wrote an article about the, the various types of religious characters uh, in Bitcoin. Max would be, you know, uh, way up there. Uh, but even for the, for the casual churchgoers, uh, put your money where your mouth is. Put a couple of Satoshi in the hat when it's getting passed around. Uh, so, uh, like, if, if you want the, the revolution to succeed, you, you must put your money where your mouth is. And uh, a lot of, you know, in, it's not just a US problem, it's an international problem. The people yeah. with their money put it behind their mouth and, uh, you know, they do that to back a politician and to influence a politician. But, uh, you know, never, never underestimate the power of a group of powerless people. Exactly. So uh, if we, if I wanted, because I, I th I've been thinking, I've been thinking before the, the podcast, so like, what could be like the perfect meme as a title for our talk, <laughs> like to make it really effective, like emotionally touching or, you know, picking up the people where they are. Uh, now I got a couple of inspirations. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So to, to wrap this up, what would you say, what, what would be like the spontaneous meme for, for you? I mean, to put it as a title, guys, friend has. Don't trip. Stack stats <laughs> for salvation. <laughs> <laughs> I would change that and say do trip, do trip. yeah <laughs> trip responsibly and yeah. stack <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, I love yeah. that okay now we got it got it got it got it <laughs> okay guys thank you so much I, I really enjoyed our talk it's really inspirational every time um I uh, hope we can repeat this maybe next time with Brand, Ben Prentice. Uh, he's going to miss this, but I'm sure he's going to listen to it. And maybe we can, you know, take another angle. And um, yeah, so I'll have a good sleep tonight <laughs> and yeah, process I'm everything always, uh, we talked about. Yeah, I'm working, yeah, I'm working on a 90-minute on a, on a Bitcoin talk. Really? Uh, so I'll be, I'll be on PowerPoint all day today presenting, uh, presenting in two weeks. So it uh, should be fun. All right. Well, Brandon, thanks awesome. so much for breaking everything down for, you know, for, for sharing your thoughts and knowledge and has, you know, for your salvation, keep it up, <laughs> keep up yeah, your no, great I work. Will do. My absolute pleasure. All right. Yeah. I appreciate it guys. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Love right. hanging out. Take, take care of yourselves. Catch you soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Welcome to the podcast show by Kevan Davani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin.